Good afternoon and welcome again to the group exhibit for hydrogen fuel cells and batteries at the Hanover Fair 2017. Please, everyone uh, sit, standing on the outside, please feel free to come in and sit down. Looks like most of the chairs are free, but there's a couple available up front. Uh, there's complimentary bever beverages um, as well. My name is Michael Sinclair, and I'll be the moderator for the following discussion. It's uh, my honor to host up here uh, industry members from the IPHE Policy Forum, which is the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy. Uh, this is a meeting that's taking place in Hamburg, and they, these uh, industry members have been nice enough to come down here to, uh, to the fair uh, and, and present uh, some of the uh, topics for discussion. So with, uh, with my pleasure, I will introduce now our panel. Immediately uh, to my left, your right, we have Valérie Bouillon. She is the strategic leader at, uh, at Michelin. She is also a board member for Hydrogen Europe in the transport pillar. And she is also a board member for the French National Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you. Next, uh, next on the list is Dr. Graham Cooley. He is the CEO of ITM Power. Their booth is uh, just right here, and uh, he's based out of the United Kingdom. And next, we have Bart Beboik. Uh, he is the executive director of the uh, Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. And last but not least, we have Gabriele Schmiedel. She is the CEO of Hydrogen Solutions at Siemens here in Germany. So thank you all uh, for joining me here on stage. I'll start with a question for you, uh, Bart. Uh, your organization is unique on the panel. Uh, you are the only public-private partnership representative here. Um, maybe you could begin by telling us uh, about your initiatives. Yeah, so um, thank you very much of, to have me here on the panel. So um, for us, we are an, indeed a public-private partnership, meaning that half of uh, we are in the industry and the other half we are basically from the European Commission. So one of the initiatives that we are really recently taken is really we would like to bring the products as fast as possible to the market. That's why we do a lot of research and demonstration programs, but also we need to reach out to the people in the street. And that's why we started recently a new initiative last year, actually in November, where we tried to reach out to the cities and the region. And uh, we, sign, we asked them really to sign, uh, to work with us, with cooperation, we signed an MOU with them. And actually the purpose is uh, to sit down with them, so to bring the industry and actually also the demand, which is then basically the, the regions or the city, bring them together, work out uh, how we can bring those products as fast as possible in their city or in their region on the one hand. On the other hand, also we are looking with them whether in their region is there any interesting uh, business that they can do. Can they create jobs and growth using hydrogen and fuel cells technology? That's the second part. And the third part, we are also looking with them how we can combine funding, regional fundings and national fundings, European funding, in order to make it happen. The key point for us, bringing the products to the people that they can experience and once they experience them, they can also talk to their uh, colleagues, friends and so on about this uh, technologies and that's how the market will grow. Thank you. Um, Gabriele, Siemens is a very large organization. There's, uh, you know, you guys do a lot of different things, especially in energy. Um, what fuel cell market has Siemens identified as having the most opportunity? We see, uh, and for the hydrogen, three different areas where we can apply the hydrogen. It's on the one hand side mobility, individual mobility, but also trains, which you can see from Alstom. Um, but you can also use it in industry, that means in the refineries, chemical industries, and you can use it in energy applications. So we see it very broad how the hydrogen which is produced via electrolysis can be used. And we are right now exploring all of them and looking where we can push it the fastest and some people things will come earlier some will come later so my personal opinion is within the individual mobility it will take some time well like with the battery electric mobility but if you look to fleets and if you look to industry this will be something where the push might come much faster but regulations also need to be pro-hydrogen. They are right now not really pro-hydrogen. Great. I have some questions on regulations that will come up uh, in just a few minutes. Yeah. Um, uh, Valerie, uh, Michelin is primarily known for tires. 
Um, but so how, explain to us, how does hydrogen uh, fit in with uh, your strategic vision at your company? Okay, that's the usual question that everybody asks. Uh, why is Michelin interested in fuel cell technologies? We're not newborn in this technology. We've been active in the fuel cell since uh, nearly 20 years. Uh, we did a lot of research and developing uh, fuel cell technology. <coughs> you know that Michelin is very active in sustainable mobility. That's our motus. So it goes beyond tires. Uh, of course, most of our activity is still coming out of tires, but our strategy is defined in four pillars. One of these pillars is tires, but another one is materials, and fuel cell fit perfectly in the fourth pillar dealing with materials. And for Michelin, I mean, it's a no-brainer. Sustainable mobility is key if we want to reach the objective of uh, decarbonating transportation. And with battery alone, it will not be possible. So hydrogen will be part of the picture. And hydrogen is already part of the picture. So far, um, many of, uh, of our guests here have spoken about transportation. Uh, Graham, you come from a little bit of a diff different background. You're mostly focused on uh, power to gas uh, applications, uh, generating um, f uh, hydrogen gas from excess energy from renewables. Um, you know, what is the, why is hydrogen emerging as kind of the best way for long-term energy storage? And are there any other, other alternatives that exist? Yeah, so our, our primary interest is using hydrogen for energy storage, as you said. We make rapid response electrolysis, so you can connect it directly to renewable power, or can, you can use it to balance the grid. And as we end up with more and more uh, renewable energy, because it's intermittent, you have an excess of renewables. So for instance, in the UK, uh, we could tell 1.5 terawatt hours of wind last year. Um, now all you need it to do is have the electrolysis equipment to balance against that curtailment. Uh, you end up not having to pay the curtailment fees and you make a useful product which is hydrogen as a fuel for transport or indeed for injecting it into the gas grid. So I, th I think there needs to be some joined up thinking in terms of energy, uh, the way that we use renewables, the way we, we balance our network, our power network. Um, and the production of hydrogen means you have very, very large scale, long duration energy storage. And that's our interest. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So today we launched our 100 megawatt designs. Uh, we regularly now sell um, electrolyzers in the range between one and six megawatts and we're going up in scale. We're going up in scale because the demand for electrolysis is larger and larger units. It's for refineries, chemistry, power to gas energy storage, buses, trains, a, a massive amount of development going on in the area of hydrogen fuel. Why, what is it that's so hard about energy storage at the grid level? And, uh, and again, why has hydrogen emerged as the, as the leader there? Yeah, I mean, inherently it's difficult to store electricity. And actually, the most important uh, principle of hydrogen is it's an energy vector. And once you store, it's very easy to store a gas, particularly storing a gas in the gas grid which we already own and is much larger than the electricity grid. The gas grid is actually three times the size of the power grid in the UK. So it's an incredible tank for energy. And, and the thing about hydrogen is you can store it for very long periods of time, whereas of course you can't store electricity. So as a, an energy vector for the power industry to repower or the gas industry to decarbonize gas or transport, to decarbonize transport. So it's a very effective way of doing it. It's long duration energy storage on a massive scale. This is a question for Gabriele. Uh, what would, uh, would large-scale infrastructure look like for a very low or a zero carbon grid? Um, and is, you know, along with that, is this practical? What kind of investment would it take? So um, we are looking in all our energy solutions which we are providing within Siemens more and more, um, as Graham mentioned, we have more and more renewable energies in different areas of the world, be it wind or be it uh, solar power. And um, the question comes up what to do with that, uh, with that surplus energy and not curtailing it. 
So we are providing from our side uh, battery systems. If you have a small duration and not so much energy to cover, but this is the same as we want to go for storage and for large scale storage. A side of a wind park or a side of a, a, a PV plant, but also storage in other areas to, for instance, if it is very volatile, then have a storage and afterwards use it in whatever you want to use it for. So this is similar. We are also planning uh, big uh, solutions, and right now we are um, building a six megawatt plant in um, Austria together with First and Verbund. And um, we are in discussions for big, larger systems with other customers. We are delivering right now a five megawatt system uh, by end of June into a refinery. So there is more and more upcoming. And when I said the regulations need to be pro-hydrogen, then it is that this business is growing. Right now we have, um, also from the EU, we have fundings, but fundings which go more to an R&D environment. And we are right now, the, the, the technology is ready. We need applications um, funding. Because the thing is, when we discuss with customers, they are going into the sector coupling. So they encounter new areas. And also for that, they need to see how can they go into that one and need some help. So the technology is something which is out of the pure R&D factor. It's there. It has to grow. It has to become big to really do big storages. And we are more and more going into that direction. Yeah, so along that same vein, let's talk about uh, policy. Um, what, I guess maybe I'll direct this question at Bart, but really it's for any of you. Um, Bart, why don't you start? Which global market has the most favorable public policy or regulatory environment for hydrogen right now? <coughs> well, um, depends, of course, if you talk about energy or about transportation. So, but indeed, there are some, um, let's say, areas where they really select hydrogen as the, let's say, the main. Um, key driver or for the economic growth. For example, if you take Japan, they claim they want to be a hydrogen society. So, of course, they have quite a lot of uh, support, financial support and policies for that. If you look, for example, to the US and especially California also there, they have uh, special policies. So in Europe also we are working on uh, several policies and of course that's the European Commission because we are a public-private partnership on that. But uh, for example, one of the projects that we did was uh, to uh, have a definition of guarantees of uh, origin for green hydrogen. So and that we have decided last year a definition where all the industry agreed look this is green hydrogen and okay. now the next step is to uh, set up a system that they can yeah. book and claim such a kind of guarantees and that this is also coming into the policy because at that time you will get some value for your green hydrogen that you produce that's one thing on the other hand also on the policy we have to look also here in europe but in, in generally basically hydrogen is providing a service to the grid basically because you store so basically the it's a service so and at the moment that service is not really rewarded financially i think once such a policies might come also in place in in the areas and in, in countries and so on that really will take have an, a big uptake uh, for this technology yeah but also if you look to the and uh, what we have discussed yesterday with the european commissioner where we gave him a document where we also pushed him. There are regulations on the European level which are differently interpreted right now. For instance, in refineries, if you use green hydrogen instead of conventional hydrogen, this is not really calculated in the right way. Or if you use in traditional fuel generation production, also there you have hydrogen in there today you use for what everybody use when going to the gas station there is biofuel in there which comes from plants and if you would use green hydrogen for that and this would be also uh, be recognized then you could use that green uh, or this green fuel from green hydrogen and the, these there are regulations which have been made years before, where hydrogen was not, not at that stage. Yeah. And if we could change that one, that would help the hydrogen industry dramatically without additional money 
and without any additional waiting, this could be done now. And this is what we told the Commissioner yesterday. So let's see. I think the, um, the winter package, which was published by the EC uh, in November of last year, uh, had three very important things in it. One was the change in the definition of energy storage, which now encompasses power to gas energy storage and the use of hydrogen as an energy vector. That was very important. Second uh, piece of legislation was uh, the dispatching of loads, stores and generators which now all have equal dispatch rules. And by law, the last thing you're allowed to do is curtail a renewable. So that was very important, particularly as an electrolyzer is effectively dispatching a load to produce hydrogen to do energy storage. Okay, the third one was a green hydrogen certification scheme, which is now going through the EC as well. It's very important. I, I think what would change the landscape for hydrogen entirely um, is um, if there's an equivalence between hydrogen and biogas, which is what you were saying in the area of refineries. Um, in the UK, we have something called the Renewable Heat Incentive. And actually, what the EU now needs to concentrate on is not only hydrogen as energy storage, but when you store um, re excess renewable power and you put the hydrogen in the gas grid, you're providing renewable heat. Mm -hmm. And heat is more difficult to decarbonise than electricity or transport. And actually the bulk mass use of hydrogen can be power to gas for heat. So I think there's an, a whole other way of looking at hydrogen, which is to look at the way that we value hydrogen in the gas grid. That gives you volume, that means all of the costs come down. And once all the costs come down for that application, you can use it in all other applications, including transport. So I have a solar technology background, not a fuel cells background. And yep. there's a long-standing debates on how to best fund or help subsidize or, or, um, or support a solar technology uh, in every market. You know, there's these debates, especially across the US, uh, there's all kinds of different debates going on in different states. Is the same, does the same debate exist uh, for hydrogen? And what are the different sides of that debate? What, in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, helping it to be, uh, get to you know, commercial readiness, what are the different ways that people are proposing to help fund the technology? Well, maybe just uh, what we are doing in our um, PPP or in the fuel cells and engine undertaking is really to bring from early research on the technology to really bring it into uh, the point that it's uh, market ready. Okay, and uh, so where we see is that in the very beginning you need, for example, the bus project is a really good project. So the first buses that the hydrogen buses were like it costed 1.8 million euro and it was like 100% funded for us because nobody wanted to do it and you really start to research in that. Now when we see now the latest calls where we have. Uh, 150 buses or 130 buses, there we only fund 25%. So you really see that through, uh, like, say, five, six years' time, we really be able to um, reduce our funding rate, that more the industry, the private sector is willing now to invest more. So because we really started to um, make them believe that this is one of a good technology for the future. And from now on, I think now we have so many funded so many uh, buses that the next step is really to find some financial instruments. So really we need to go away from that funding to really private investment, capital venture investment, to maybe build a special purpose vehicle and that they pick it up and start to really uh, build buses now on more bigger volumes, like right? 200, 300, 500 buses. So that would be the next step. But you can really see that supporting from research then to first uh, deployment, little deployment, start to learn how it is re in real life, and then finally you have to have a financial instrument. And that would be the next step for us. Uh, I think what is key is what we heard this morning as well, uh, is that subsidies are not there forever, but they are very critical in order to spur and kick off the market, especially when uh, hydrogen uh, is starting uh, in transportation, but in energy storage as well. But you need these subsidies in different forms. And you need them in order to uh, pursue state-of-the-art technology. So you do need still to invest for the second technology in terms of uh, hydrogen technologies. But uh, this morning as well, uh, there was um, something 
thing that uh, Klaus Bonhoff said about market activation. And I think it's key that once you started the demonstration program, like Bart said, by decreasing the prices, you need to push uh, these technologies by different means, not only subsidies, but some people will call that consumer incentive, I, I rather call them positive reinforcement because it's not necessarily monetary or euro uh, subsidies, it could be also privileges. You need to reinforce the feeling that these customers opt for the good choice, which is a zero emission vehicle, whether it has a battery, whether it has a hydrogen. And you need to do the same in terms of infrastructure as well. So when a country is very virtuous in pushing uh, some strength into deploying infrastructure, then we need to find some market activation program rather than just funding and subsidies program. I, I think we should stop thinking about subsidies really in mm. this sense, that if the planet is to decarbonise, it has to value carbon. Yeah. yeah. We have a fuel with no carbon molecule in it, and that's not valued today because we don't have a carbon price. And, and um, you know, it's a very political issue, I understand that. But when the world values carbon, then it will value hydrogen. It's a very simple and straightforward thing. Today, the driving force is air quality in inner cities. So it's about, the, it's about um, emissions. But ultimately, it's about the world being able to store all of its excess renewable power and decarbonize any application, any energy application. And the way you incentivize that at the top level, globally, is you value carbon. Very good. So um, we spoke about you know, the, the need for financing as this uh, industry matures. As it stands right now, you know, who is, who's funding these, uh, a lot of these installations? Who's operating them? And do we need business model innovation uh, in order to enable uh, further uh, deployment of the technologies? I'm sorry, do you, I, I mean, uh, my view is with any new technology and with any new market, you need to have new business models. And I think, um, you know, uh, uh, Bart mentioned buses. I mean, buses are very important now because you have a tied customer for a large amount of fuel. That means you can build a refueling station based on electrolysis with a high utilisation of the equipment and get a return on your money. So you can put together a commercial business case. OK, it's more difficult to do that with an infrastructure refueler. That's why you need grant money to get that industry moving. So I think we, uh, we've got more buses, uh, we've got more commercial vehicles, uh, more forklift trucks, tr trains even. All these other uh, um, uh, technologies for vehicles always go back to the same place to refuel. So having a model based on return to base refueling, like the French mobility model, actually is a very elegant way of starting the whole thing off. I asked earlier about um, the infrastructure requirements for uh, a hydrogen economy. A lot of renewables are being deployed in a uh, distributed way. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about here with hydrogen is more centralized uh, generation, being close to the power source. I asked a, a question of Ginner, uh, the gentleman of Ginner earlier today, and I'd like to hear the panel's uh, uh, also your, you know your feedback on it. You know. How, you know, how do you reconcile those two different trends in the sense that, in the sense that a lot of uh, renewables are, are, are distributed and, and a lot of uh, centralized generation is kind of uh, considered an older approach? What we see is you can have electrolysis also decentralized, not in very small towns, but we have also customers doing that decentralized. So there where the power is generated or where the wind and the sun is shining, you do electrolysis and you use it there. The important thing is for these kind of business models is that you value, as Graham said, you value decarbonization. In Germany right now, if a customer of ours uses electrolysis, they have to pay fees because they are using power as if you're using power. They are not freed out of that, except if they are on a very high level power user. So from this perspective, this is something which is not pushing the business model. 
So from this perspective, yes, it can be decentralized, and yes, it can be centralized, but we see a lot where it is decentralized and not everything is centralized where the power plant is. So from this perspective, but it's important that this business, we will have both, that these business models run is that we have valued, as Graham said, valued the hydrogen and that it is a decarbonization factor. Maybe just to add on that, because we just uh, are in the phase of finishing a study of e early uh, business models for electrolyzers. And um, well, it's not yet completely finished. By June, we will publish or we will announce the results. But one of the areas we're looking into is semi-centralized. So that means that you mm. build basically an electrolyzer that can produce hydrogen to serve several or two, three, four, five um, refueling stations. And that there we see that some business model might start to work. That were the preliminary results so far in the study. We are working further on that. but. So it's not about centralized or completely decentralized, but kind of semi-centralized. A hybrid uh, approach, yeah. yes. <coughs> and I would like to give you the example of France. Uh, in France, last year, the government issued a call for project to, uh, for the decentralization and production of hydrogen into territories. And I think that now it's a no-brainer to decide whether hydrogen should be decentralized or centralized, because you had 98 cities and regions which candidated to be part of this project. So, uh, I mean, nearly 100 uh, parts, uh, cities and regions in France voted to have decentralized production of hydrogen and build project with, econom with some economic uh, robustness and positive business model out of it. So, it's already ongoing. Yeah, so, so look, if you're looking at energy storage and grid balancing, uh, you need to connect the electrolyzers, which are the manipulable load, to the high voltage network. Because the problem with renewables is frequency on the network. You balance frequency with a rapid response load. Okay, now you can balance the um, high voltage network for frequency wherever the load is. It doesn't have to be next to the renewable, you just have to connect. Uh, to the high voltage network. So that's the first thing. Um, and what you're doing uh, with, with electrolysis equipment is you're turning it on and off ra rapidly to balance frequency, okay? It's the right way round as well because if you have excess renewables, you have less inertia on the network and the frequency rises and you balance rising frequency with turning on a load which is an electrolyzer in our case. Okay, so the, the answer to centralized or decentralized, it doesn't matter, so long as you're connected to the high voltage network. Um, we're interested in making hydrogen on site. So we, we, we make uh, electrolyzers that go on the refueling stations. The reason for that is that if you make the um, hydrogen on site, there's no carbon in transporting it from where it's made to where it's used. So you bring, a, you, you have the opportunity to balance the network, but also bring the production center to the user. Okay, this is one of the incredible advantages of hydrogen, that you don't have to truck it around using diesel on our roads. You simply put a box on a forecourt and make the fuel there. Or it could be a hydrogen truck with the world's biggest fuel tank. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need, as you say, we need new business models. We always think of fuel as made at a refinery, in a big tanker, goes to the petrol station. You don't need to do that anymore. You buy one of those boxes, put it behind the car wash, plug it into water and electricity, and make renewable hydrogen. And it's clean at the point where you make it, because it's never seen any carbon, because it's made electrolytically. So that's a better model, in our view. Wonderful. I'd like to invite the audience. If the audience has any questions, you could raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. OK, then we'll continue. Um, I'll ask a question that uh, you know, I think a lot of, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a sad question to ask, but at the same time, I feel like it's worthy of asking. 
um, you know, this world uh, that we live in is, uh, has increasing security risks. Does hydrogen have unique security risks? I mean, you know, the exploding, you know, Zeppelin from, from back in the days comes to mind, obviously, but uh, what can the panel comment on, on uh, distributed or centralized hydrogen generation, the storage thereof, and any uh, security risks that accompany it? Okay, I, I would like to tease you first. You know who the best ambassadors for hydrogen in transportation are? No, I don't. Please tell me. Okay, the firemen. And I know in some countries, yeah. especially in France, the firemen are buying uh, hydrogen vehicles and they use it in their day-to-day -day routine. So for them, they love hydrogen because when you have a car accident with hydrogen, it's very easy to handle and to tackle. And it's much safe, safer than an IC vehicle because you can approach the vehicle and the heat is not the same. So they really love hydrogen. So. Firemen are our best ambassadors. Okay. So you mentioned the Hindenburg, mm. which was 1937. Can you give me another example of an unsafe event with hydrogen since 1937? Because if you can't, that's a pretty good record, isn't it? I'll put that to the audience. Can anybody uh, help me out here? <laughs> I mean, uh, no, sir, what I you have to remember is that it's the lightest fuel. So as soon as you pierce a hydrogen tank, it's gone in seconds. Mm. You don't get engulfed in flames. Um, the, the whole Zeppelin thing has been used by the plug-in electric vehicle industry. And it's got inside everybody's heads. It's, it's been a very clever anti-marketing campaign. Fair enough. Well, maybe just to add to that is that basically already today hydrogen is in our uh, everyday life. I mean, how many trucks on the road at this moment yeah. are driving uh, gigantic a lot? I mean, we're selling, I think, 450 million tons of hydrogen every year. So that has to be transported. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is safe. I mean, the industry, they know what they are doing. They're working with this uh, gas already since years. I mean, there's nothing new to that. So. If that's the need, the only accident, I'm sure it's safe because we transport already so much hydrogen, so I would yeah, no absolutely. Problem. What I found interesting uh, when I started in that business is what Bart said: two percent of worldwide via electrolysis produced hydrogen. It's only two percent. The rest is produced via steam reforming processes worldwide. That means every year. People know what to do with hydrogen. There are some new applications, especially in transport, especially in individual transport, where the people get contact with it. Most of the people don't know where you always use hydrogen. It's in uh, such a lot of industries, even though in um, food industry, hydrogen is used in the process of generating some of our food. So from this perspective, people know how to handle that, especially the industry. This has been an excellent discussion so far. Maybe uh, we're kind of wrapping up some final questions, uh, unless there's anything from the audience. Uh, yes. Just to make it clear that the Zeppelin was not caught in fire because of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. correct. It's correct. <laughs> yeah. was, was the um, treatment of the fabric of, of the material that made the... I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Uh, as the, to the title of this discussion, fuel cells and hydrogen in the economy, that hydrogen is most important since 100 years and more, it was summarized by you very clearly. But would you like, would you be able or would you be so kind to summarize now fuel cells and hydrogen as one package right now with yeah. a short term perspective, not with the one in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? You see, my hair is rather white. I would like to have many cars on the street and from the industry side or from industry perspective I would like to have an answer which I will still uh, alive. Sure. So f for me the, the key thing about the fuel cell is it's very high efficiency as an energy converter. And if you use renewable hydrogen with it, it can be zero emission. There aren't any other combinations where you can do that. So if you put hydrogen into an internal combustion engine, you get half the efficiency that you do if you put it into a fuel cell. Fuel cells are also light. 
they decouple couple energy from power in a way that you don't with a battery. So the principle of using um, a, a fuel cell as motive power is a very well established one. All the fuel cells that are out there now uh, um, that are coming from the car companies are made by the car companies and or collaborations between car companies. They have invested billions in the development of those powertrains. It's not something that they did lightly and I am absolutely convinced when a large international OEM invests that much money in development that they're serious about it. Okay, so I, I, I have great confidence now in a way that I didn't see that confidence 10 years ago, particularly in California, because the car companies weren't behind the initiative, but they are now. And, 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 and the Japanese car companies mainly, sorry. And you also have not only the vehicle manufacturers, but also the tier one and the tier two manufacturers are investing massively into uh, components for hydrogen cars. So it's a very good sign because that proves that it's ongoing. So of course, you will have to wait maybe a cal couple of years more in order to have 100 or 1 million or 10 million vehicles. But when you look at what happened in the past two years, a lot of things occurred, not only in Japan, but also in California, in Europe, and many countries in Europe are developing a f a fuel cell transportation, which is a very good sign. The industry is actually coming quite quickly now. I mean, if you look at coal, oil, gas, and hydrogen, and the reduction in the amount of carbon molecules in each fuel, and you look at how long they took to get to saturation, you'll actually find that hydrogen is moving very quickly. Okay, any other questions? We're just about out of time. Wonderful. Well, it's been a real pleasure to host thank this uh, discussion, and uh, I want to thank all of you for joining me on stage. Could we please give our panel a round of applause? Up next in the public forum will be a conversation with the CEO of PowerCell Sweden. The, the title of the talk is The New Fuel Cell uh, Off-Grid Solution. So thank you all very much.